Aurelia's Unfortunate Young Men by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Charles Culbertson of Stanton, Virginia. Aurelia's Unfortunate Young Man by Mark Twain. The facts in the following case came to me by letter from a young lady who lives in the beautiful city of San Jose. She is perfectly unknown to me, and simply signs herself Aurelia Maria, which may possibly be a fictitious name. But no matter. The poor girl is almost heartbroken by the misfortunes she has undergone, and so confused by the conflicting counsels of misguided friends and insidious enemies, that she does not know what course to pursue in order to extricate herself from the web of difficulties in which she seems almost hopelessly involved. In this dilemma she turns to me for help, and supplicates for my guidance and instruction with a moving eloquence that would touch the heart of a statue. Hear her sad story. She says that when she was sixteen years old, she met and loved, with all the devotion of a passionate nature, a young man from New Jersey named Williamson Breckenridge Carruthers, who was some six years her senior. They were engaged with the free consent of their friends and relatives, and for a time it seemed as if their career was destined to be characterized by an immunity from sorrow beyond the usual lot of humanity. But at last the tide of fortune turned. Young Carruthers became infected with smallpox of the most virulent type, and when he recovered from his illness his face was pitted like a waffle mold, and his comeliness gone forever. Aurelia thought to break off the engagement at first, but pity for her unfortunate lover caused her to postpone the marriage day for a season and give him another trial. The very day before the wedding was to have taken place, Breckenridge, while absorbed in watching the flight of a balloon, walked into a well and fractured one of his legs, and it had to be taken off above the knee. Again, Aurelia was moved to break the engagement, but again love triumphed, and she set the day forward and gave him another chance to reform. And again misfortune overtook the unhappy youth. He lost one arm by the premature discharge of a Fourth of July cannon, and within three months he got the other pulled out by a carding machine. Aurelia's heart was almost crushed by these latter calamities. She could not but be deeply grieved to see her lover passing from her by piecemeal, feeling as she did that he could not last forever under this disastrous process of reduction, yet knowing of no way to stop his dreadful career and in her tearful despair she almost regretted, uh, like brokers who hold on and lose, that she had not taken him at first, before he had suffered such an alarming depreciation. Still her brave soul bore her up, and she resolved to bear with her friend's unnatural disposition yet a little longer. Again the wedding day approached, and again disappointment overshadowed it. Carruthers fell ill with the erysipelas, and lost the use of one of his eyes entirely. The friends and relatives of the bride, considering that she had already put up with more than could reasonably be expected of her, now came forward and insisted that the match should be broken off. But after wavering a while, Aurelia, with a generous spirit which did her credit, said she had reflected calmly upon the matter, and could not discover that Brackenridge was to blame. So she extended the time once more, and he broke his other leg. It was a sad day for the poor girl when she saw the surgeons reverently bearing away the sack whose uses she had learned by previous experience, and her heart told her the bitter truth that some more of her lover was gone. She felt that the field of her affections was growing more and more circumscribed every day, but once more she frowned down her relatives and renewed her betrothal. Shortly before the time set for the nuptials, another disaster occurred. There was but one man scalped by the Owens River Indians last year, 
That man was Williamson Breckenridge Carruthers of New Jersey. He was hurrying home with happiness in his heart when he lost his hair forever, and in that hour of bitterness he almost cursed the mistaken mercy that had spared his head. At last Aurelia is in serious perplexity as to what she ought to do. She still loves her Breckenridge, she writes, with truly womanly feeling. She still loves what is left of him. But her parents are bitterly opposed to the match, because he has no property and is disabled from working, and she has not sufficient means to support both comfortably. Now, what should she do? she asked with painful and anxious solicitude. It is a delicate question. It is one which involves the lifelong happiness of a woman and that of nearly two-thirds of a man, and I feel that it would be assuming too great a responsibility to do more than make a mere suggestion in the case. How would it do to build to him? If Aurelia can afford the expense, let her furnish her mutilated lover with wooden arms and wooden legs and a glass eye and a wig, and give him another show. Give him ninety days, without grace, and if he does not break his neck in the meantime, marry him, and take the chances. It does not seem to me that there is much risk anyway, Aurelia, because if he sticks to his singular propensity for damaging himself every time he sees a good opportunity, his next experiment is bound to finish him, and then you are safe, married or single. If married, the wooden legs and such other valuables as he may possess revert to the widow, and, you see, you sustain no actual loss save the cherished fragment of a noble but most unfortunate husband who honestly strove to do right, but whose extraordinary instincts were against him. Try it, Maria. I have thought the matter over carefully and well, and it is the only chance I see for you. It would have been a happy conceit on the part of Carruthers if he had started with his neck and broken that first, but since he has seen fit to choose a different policy and string himself out as long as possible, I do not think we ought to upbraid him for it if he has enjoyed it. We must do the best we can under the circumstances and try not to feel exasperated at him. End of Aurelia's Unfortunate Young Man by Mark Twain